Okay, welcome to another session in our Women Lead webinar series brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Michelle Berquist, your host today, as we are delighted yet again to bring another informative webinar to our Association of Professional Women. Our Women Lead webinars are designed for you, a professional leader in business, whether you are an aspiring female leader, if you're a female leading people or projects or teams or companies, we select topics and themes that support your goal to lead, achieve, and succeed more effectively in business. Our webinar today is just shy of one hour, and our thought leader is ready to share some fabulous insights and ideas, as our topic today is the resilience factor. I'm going to start that again. It's actually lead like a woman. The resilience factor is your superpower. I don't know about you guys, but I want this. And so I'm going to introduce our thought leader today. It is the amazing Patty Vargas. And let me share a little bit of information about Patty, just so you know. Um, where we're coming from here and where Patty's coming from. In 1995, Patty Vargas encountered a life-changing event that set the course for the rest of her career. What could have resulted in a dead-end, bitter saga of mere survival instead led her on a journey to discover the difference between going under or coming over. As a national seminar presenter and conference speaker, amazing speaker, by the way, Patty entertains and energizes audience on surviving and thriving during change. Experience across a wide array of industries and disciplines has demonstrated that her approach is applicable wherever change is the order of the day. Her practical message and humorous stories not to mention she's just a funny gal, um, are basically born of the joys and sorrows that can only come from experience, and they will quickly captivate and engage you. So, Patty, I want you to say hello to all of our attendees, and you are on, my dear. Hello. I am so happy to be here and to be able to share uh, the resilience factor with all of you. Thank you, Michelle, for that fabulous lead-in. And I, I want you to understand, uh, all of you that are listening, I want you to understand that this is not unique to me. This is something that we all have within us. And so what I want to bring to you is what it is, uh, how do you recognize it, how do you grow it, uh, and then how do you lean on it when you need to. But first I'd like to ask, why are women such great leaders? I mean, what is the secret sauce that gives us the ability to withstand challenges and excel? Well, I believe that the quality is maybe not unique just to women, but it's one that we are familiar with because we have all had to use it at one time or another. And yes, I'm talking about the resilience factor. So just think about women in business in general, women in their lives, in the corporate world, Women still have not achieved parity in terms of representation, position, or wage equity. We've made some progress, but face it, the more experienced, qualified woman is not necessarily going to get the job. When it comes to raising our families, 82% of single parent homes are led by women. And 76% of those are gainfully employed, so they're juggling a lot of balls and they're wearing a lot of hats, right? Now in 2011, which is the most recent year for which we have data available, 26% of college undergrads are single parents and you guessed it, 71% of them are women. So what does all of this say about a woman's ability to adjust, to flex, to be resilient? Well, it seems to me that we're made this way. The resilience factor is our superpower. And I find this fascinating, and my interest in this super, maybe secret power came about following a personal experience where I had to begin to draw on it. So what does that look like? Change is inevitable. You know, they say that the only sure thing in life is death and taxes, but it's three things, death, taxes, and change. But survival is definitely our choice. Now, your life may have looked 
something like this. You got out of high school, uh, you got into the college of your choice, you married the football player, your children are all straight A students and perfect, perfect people, right? And some people's life just seems to go this way. Mine, on the other hand, looks a little bit more like this. So our talk today is all about change and how change can be a positive catalyst, a reorientation of our perception to where it's not happening to me, I am a part of this. So my life has taken many twists and turns when it went from plan A to plan B to plan C, D, E, F, G, H, and so forth. That first picture of the perfect life trajectory is fine. If that's been your experience, that is awesome. If you're like me, your experience has been like this, that's awesome too, because it just gives us the opportunity to grow and expand and learn. Neither one is right, neither one is wrong. It's just simply the way that it is. Now, I've watched other people around me sometimes, how they react to upheaval or changing circumstances. And I mean, you've seen it, right? A, a light bulb burns out and they're like freaking out. What do we do? What do we do? I don't know, maybe change the light bulb? <laughs> because come on, we're women. We can choose to not just survive, but to thrive during times of change, upheaval, and transition. I like to say that life is what happens when we're busy making other plans. <laughs> I mean, it seems like the universe has a sense of humor all of its own. Just when you think you've got it all figured out, along comes life. And that's how I discovered that I possessed the resilience factor. I just needed to dust it off and begin to exercise it. So I had the not so unique experience of having a long-term marriage suddenly end and overnight go from married woman with three kids, a home debt position in our community, to a single shell-shocked woman with no home, but I still had the three kids and the debt, but a total loss of my identity. And faced with the necessity of providing for my family, I had to become resilient really, really fast. And through that confusing, scary, completely disruptive time, I discovered a strength I didn't know I possessed. And I learned some really great lessons to build the next phase of my life on. That's what's led to my work as a speaker and a coach, focusing on the turbulence that accompanies change, especially unexpected change, and helping others see that there is much to be gained when we consider possibility instead of just what we've lost. And resilience is a good value to develop because it's never one and done. Sorry to break it to you. There will be many, many opportunities in our lives to draw on it, whether it's a drastic upheaval event in your personal life, whether you're leading a team in your company and, and you're facing organizational change and you want to help them go through that, or if your career has taken an unexpected course correction. Developing your resilience factor is the key to a successful transition. So why do bad things happen to good people? I think you could also say, why do good things happen to bad people? And the answer is, I just, I don't know. But what I do know is that we have the ability to write the next chapter. So I'd like to make a case for adversity. Like, number one, it presents the opportunity to learn how strong you really are and that you can choose to be an overcomer and reject that victim state. Number two, adversity is the great equalizer. I was such a know-it-all. I remember clearly before I had children making comments like, my kid will never fill in the blank. And it's quite humbling to look back and realize that yes, they will, they did, and then some. And I'm also pretty sure there was a day when I couldn't conceive of my marriage ending. We were special. We did things right. If we're honest, I think we've all been highly judgmental of someone else's loss until it happens to us. It's a great equalizer. And then three, adversity is humbling. 
when we put together the strategic plan for our life, we probably don't include milestones of suffering. Here's where I lose my job. Around here is where my house burns down. But without hardship, our humanity is lacking. There's no depth to the relationship we have with others. I was so smart. I was so smug. I was so sure that none of the negative events that occurred in my life would ever occur. Adversity makes us better people, multidimensional, with more texture, and truly a greater capacity to care for others. So now that I have you all cheered up about embracing adversity, yay, <laughs> let me tell you why you are so freaking special, why we as women <laughs> possess this amazing superpower. What does the woman with the resilience factor know? And how does it make us so qualified to withstand and master change? Well, I'll tell you what, you're made for this. You are just built this way. This is the way we are supposed to be. We know how to respond and not react. And third, it's our story. It's your story. You get to control the outcome, not anybody else. It's yours. So let's break down those three factors of, uh, that make up the resilience factor. The first one, you're made for this. I love this picture. I just think this is the coolest <laughs> picture ever. So sometimes women will say to me, you know, I, I don't think I'm very resilient, to which I say, yes, you are. You just don't know it yet. You're made for this. So stand in your natural power. Believe that you are. So let me ask you this. Who do you think handles change better, men or women? Well, at the risk of overgeneralization, women tend to approach change differently than men, which often translates to handling it better. Let's consider the kind of change that impacts a group, like a department that you're leading, or a company, or a family, or something going on in your community. Women tend to be better at multitasking, which I realize doesn't exist, but women are able to manage a greater number of threads at a time and switch back and forth more readily. Women tend to involve the group. They want their input. They want their empathy. They, they want to recognize the stakeholders. They want to develop champions and use them in that sense. So women just tend to involve the group. Women consider alternatives. They are less prescriptive, where men tend to be sold on their approach to their idea or their plan. Women consider the group before themselves. They're looking for how is this going to impact my family? How is this going to impact my department that I'm leading? So how do I take care of them to make sure that we all come out better on the other side? In these kinds of scenarios, women often come up with a better solution because they look at the situation with a long range perspective. Now, how about personal change? Like, like you're making a decision to change your lifestyle, for example you know, those Monday morning diets or new healthy eating plans or, or exercise plans. Women tend to be more supportive of one another. If I were to say, hey, I'm going to start a, a, a vegan diet next week, then I would have a million women telling me their experience with it and, and what it did for them and who I should talk to and so forth. Whereas men would be more likely to make fun of one another and joke about it, not take it seriously. Women are more likely to tell others that they're making some sort of a lifestyle change, whereas men might keep it to themselves for fear of failure and, and don't want to step out and make a stand and say, I'm doing this thing. Women are as interested in the journey as the destination. <laughs> men don't <laughs> typically talk about the process, you know, but we are, you know, we're Facebooking it, we're talking, we're you know, chatting with our friends about how this thing is going for us. And then despite all the stereotypes about hysterical, emotional women, who do you think handles breakups better? Yep, women. Women probably show emotions easier and more readily, but then they get down to the business of recovery sooner. Men don't like to start over. They mask their pain. They possibly it's because they have fewer friends to really get deep with, but they 
are quickly uh, willing to jump into the dating scene and idealize it and think that it's, it's going to be all that. But when asked how likely they are to remarry following a divorce, twice as many men said yes as women. You know, women have been historically considered the caretakers of the family or the community. And while that may sound old fashioned or typecast, I believe that that deeply embedded programming to care for others is what makes us so resilient. When things need to get done, the resilient woman is the one that'll find the way. Secondly, resilient women know that it's in their power to respond versus react. Well, what's the difference? Reacting is instinctual. Responding is a conscious choice. You know, we're faced with a situation and in the context of our webinar today, it's a big situation, a life-changing situation. A marriage has ended, you've lost your job, there's been a serious health scare, all of those big things. Most of the time we react without thinking. It's a gut reaction and it's often based on fear and insecurity and it's not the most rational or appropriate way to act. Responding, on the other hand, is taking a pause considering the situation holistically and deciding the best course of action based on our own personal values, such as integrity, commitment, responsibility, et cetera. This is not easy, but fortunately, we have a lot of opportunities to practice and get it right. So here's some steps to take. Number one, separate logic from emotion. Where is this desire to react coming from? What internal programming are we relying on? The way we were raised, our cultural experiences, all of these things together create our mental programming that can be driving us to a knee-jerk reaction. It's a chain reaction of sorts. Our, our programming is our thoughts. Our thoughts create feelings that we then react to. So it's not enough to simply change the action. We need to logically short circuit the emotions or feelings that are leading to that reaction. Challenge the emotional, irrational message we're telling ourselves with a more rational and logical truth. You know, second, put the situation in context. Our fear of the unknown can rob us of perspective. A situation can become overblown, so step back, take a pause, and, and ask ourselves if we're overreacting. Remember, you have choices. You always have choices. That's number three. The unexpected can appear to be demanding an immediate action, which is not likely to be your best option. Don't let your anger, your fear, or insecurity bully you into thinking you have no choice. Every choice has a consequence, and you want to be able to consider your options and then respond to the one that will best serve you and those you love. Taking the time to respond can be a door to possibilities that you'll never see if you react in the pressure of the moment. That pause to reconsider can be just the catalyst that you need to see things differently. And third, it's your story so you control the outcome. Controlling the outcome of our story is as much about managing ourselves our inner thoughts about ourselves as it is those that we surround ourselves with. We all have that voice in the head. And if you're asking yourself, what does she mean, the voice in the head? Well, that's the voice in the head. And I don't know about you, but the voice in my head isn't usually telling me, man, Patty, you're a rock star. Patty, you're killing it. Patty, you're awesome. No, it's usually saying not so positive things. And like I mentioned before, that voice comes from our mental programming. We have to challenge that voice with a more rational truth. When the voice in my head is saying, you shouldn't have worn this outfit, you're overdressed. Tell yourself instead, get over it. No one's even looking at you. A key to controlling our self-image is ensuring the people we associate with aren't actively tearing us down or not being supportive of us on our personal journey. A cruel judgment by someone who means a lot to you or someone with a strong personality trying to impose their opinions on you can undermine all the good work you're doing. Like it or not, some people like to make you their victim. 
it somehow elevates them or it gives them a project to work on and no one needs that in their life. I had a coaching client uh, named Laura who had experienced a great deal of upheaval all at once. Her husband retired, they moved to a town where she knew no one, and the telecommuting privilege at her company was coming to an end. So she came to me with this endless litany of confusion and loss, and, and as she contemplated how terrible it would be to have to start commuting into the office each day, I asked if she had considered any alternatives. You know, I was hoping she would get creative, maybe look for another opportunity in that company, uh, investigate a job change, consider other streams of income, anything. But she was in full-blown panic mode. So I allowed the frantic stream to continue for three minutes. For those of you who find yourself on the receiving end of those kinds of downward spiral rantings, three minutes is the max allowable. I then calmly asked her to do something for me. I asked her to complete an assignment before we met again. First, I asked her to document her personal and professional demise, how she was never going to work again, she was going to go broke, she was going to become housebound and be friendless forever. I told her to be very specific and describe in great detail what that was going to look like, the kind of person she would become, how her husband would behave, the luxuries they would have to forfeit, what kind of food they would eat, which utilities they would cut off first. <laughs> And at first she was silent, and then she started to laugh nervously. She says, I, I don't understand why you want me to do this, but I didn't let her off the hook. I scheduled my next check-in with her, and I ended the meeting. A week later, a different woman showed up. Laura had completed the assignment. I think she was afraid I would fire her if she didn't. But she ended up so ashamed of her self-victimization that she decided that was not how this story was going to go. She hated the picture she was painting, and somewhere in the middle, it turned in to an exploration of possibility. It led to an open and heartfelt discussion with her husband about her fear of the future, hers and theirs. And long story short, they ended up opening a business in a field they both enjoyed. They made new friends and began a new journey. It's your story. Just because it took a deviation from your planned course, doesn't mean that you don't get to write the ending. Final tip, view your circumstance as a lesson, a point in time, not a life sentence. You're not on trial for past transgressions. It's really helpful to think big picture. The author uh, Chuck Palahniuk said, the trick to forgetting the big picture is to look at everything close up. And it's, it's hard to maintain perspective when we view everything that is happening through this one lens, through this event, this one thing that we're going through. So one way to look at it is, is maybe create 2020 vision. We all know that hindsight is 2020, but try to move yourself into the future and look back with imagined 2020 vision to put it all into perspective. When, when I feel overwhelmed, I will often say to myself, this time next week, I won't feel this way. Or this time next month, this will all be just a memory. As I journey through life, I find that the more I learn, the less I know. <laughs> Meaning <laughs> head knowledge, it's experience that locks in what I know. I believe I know that adversity makes us better people. And it doesn't have to be a catastrophic, near-death, end-of-the-world kind of adversity. So don't worry if your challenges have been relatively minor. Don't go looking for trouble if it hasn't happened. But instead, just you know, take, take this opportunity to exercise your resilience factor. It's what makes us better people. And you know, advice from someone who has never experienced a single setback is pretty empty. It's just theory. The power comes from the experience. No one can argue with what we've been through. And it's within our power to say, my experiences don't derail me. They propel me. It's a lesson, not a life sentence. On this slide, I have one of my favorite quotes from Bill Gates, that success is a lousy teacher. It makes smart people think they can't <laughs> lose. And that is really the truth. If you've never failed, if you've never had a setback, 
we're really not in a position to share with others or to be of a lot of of use to others. It's our experience that makes us stronger. It's our experience that makes us of value in the world and a value to others. Wow. So finally, are women leaders more resilient than men? Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. In a nutshell, yes, they are. And how do you learn to respond instead of react? Well, that comes with experience as well. Taking that pause, taking a breath, taking a minute to think, if I do this, this is likely to be the outcome. I don't like that outcome so much. I think I'm going to go this way. And then when you are in the midst of a challenge, in the midst of a trial, encourage yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Don't be so hard on yourself. You know, nobody gets out of this life alive. So every opportunity to experience the resilience factor in our lives is just another, another step away from, from who we are or where we, where we were. That's what I have for you, my people, my friends. And I would like to invite you to um, stay the course. I have uh, seminars, one-on-one -on -one coaching. I have a Facebook community. So some of the links are down there of ways that you can connect with me. If you happen to be in the San Francisco Bay Area, we have a fabulous all-day symposium coming up on September 30th. And I'm really super excited to announce that my book is coming out on this topic in mm -hmm. October, published by Women Lead Publishing. So there's going to be lots of opportunities to, to hear from me and stay connected. And I would love, love, love to join you on your resilience journey. Awesome job, Patty. You know, I'm, I'm like, great job. It's like now we have a ton of questions. And I'm finding <laughs> this, if I can say, this is me being authentic because <clears throat> I want to share this because I – feel like you were talking straight to me today <laughs> like oh. on this subject. I'm going, oh my God. Well, just from the standpoint that, you know, I think resilience and, and dealing with change, they're similar, right? I mean, can mm -hmm. you kind of share the, the similarities and the differences a little bit more? Because in my mind, I'm seeing as dealing with change. I mean, when change happens, we're, we're hesitant, we're resistant, but that that's resilience too, right? I mean, is, is mm -hmm. resilience and having that and being better always when there's change or is there another time when we need to be resilient? Cause I equate it with change. Yeah. And, and I uh, typically equate it with change as well, but it doesn't have to be, like I said, a giant change. It can be um, something as, as simple as um, you were planning a party and it was going to go like this and it was going to be on this date and these were the people that were going to be there and then something happens it rains or you know someone gets sick or whatever and now you got to drop back and punt some to some people that would be a big major thing it's just it's awful it's the end of the world but it's a chance to exercise resilience too every bit as much as losing a job unexpectedly or um, you know, losing, losing a marriage or, or uh, any of those kinds of things. Those are the big things we tend to think of, but it's all change. And most people are change averse. You know, there are, there are folks that will say, oh, no, I'm, I love change. I'm a change junkie. No, you're not. You adapt to change better in some circumstances than you do in other circumstances. But most of us are change averse. Does that answer and, your and question? That leads to, yeah, no, totally. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a discussion here. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of questions from, come in, so I'm trying to, nice. you know, kind of bucket them. But one of them, one question was, why do you think we have such a hard time being resilient, both professionally and personally? Uh, I'll speak from myself. Um, my tendency is to jump into solution mode immediately. I am a planner. I am a problem solver. That's, that's just the way that I am wired. So I, I'm confronted with something and I just begin to address it. It's, it's very much that knee jerk reaction that I was talking about without really stopping to think, is this, is this the right thing to do? Or even recognizing, wow, this is a major change. It would be a good idea to 
step back and take a pause. It's, I think it's just more like we are wired to just get down to it and start, you know, dealing with it and powering through it. Um, and that's not necessarily the best way to handle it. Mm -hmm. Well, and I mean, can you share some steps that you think people can either act on or, you know, go through so they can be more resilient? Like I think, I mean, I, you know, while I like to think, oh yeah, I thrive on change. It's like, oh my gosh, I resist it as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the question becomes resilient is such a a better word than dealing with change, right? Because I we all want to be resilient, right? It's either like you're either using a smartphone or a dumb phone right now. And it's like, you're not being very resilient if you haven't, you know, moved over to where technology is today. But I guess maybe there's some suggestions you could make on what are some behaviors or um, thought ideas of how to be more resilient like what can people do what could women do to be you know kind of like catch themselves right because when mm -hmm. we're in the moment it's emotional we're not handling it well what what would be some tips you would suggest I think addressing the voice in the head is number one that is the first thing um, yeah. you know we, we've all got that voice in the head and like I mentioned it's not usually our friend the things it's saying are not usually you know, in our best interest, more or less. So it's the first thing, and, and I, I know that this sounds simplistic, but it is just so true, is you have to short circuit that. You have to hear the voice, you know, first of all, you know, recognize, man, I've, I've, I've seen this movie, you know, I've heard this song before, <laughs> I know where this is gonna go. So recognize it and then replace it with a more logical, rational thought. And I'm not talking about uh, Pollyanna, you know, everything is coming up roses. I don't like that. I, I don't think that's very helpful to anybody when you just ignore what's really going on and just say, oh, everything will be fine or everything happens for a reason. Instead, it's more like check that thought. Is that really the truth is that really what's happening here you know you're so dumb you're not going to get this job what <laughs> makes you think you would get this job well that's not true of course you're smart and and guess what you get to choose whether you want to apply for this job or not and and if they offer it to you you get to choose whether you're going to take it or not but short circuiting that that negative little voice in your head is is the best thing that's the first place to start i can't stress that enough love that you know they made a, they made a movie on that right they called yes. it you remember the movie by disney inside out yes absolutely <laughs> oh my god i just crack up because if you can visualize you know the the joy which mm -hmm. is where you want to be right versus the fear versus that little blue lady the little worry lady i'd like <laughs> always crack up with her because i just want to squash her like a piece of you know get rid yeah. of her get rid yeah. of her yeah. What, besides the voices in your head, what else can you do to be resilient? I mean, I, I'd love to hear some, because, you know, I, I agree, the head part is the toughest part, but mm -hmm. what else would you suggest are some ways to be more resilient and kind of work through something that's giving you that change and you're being resistant to it? Well, there's, there's two, two other things I would suggest, and, um, and they all sort of go along with managing that voice in, in your head or the little blue lady. By the way, she sleeps with me. She usually wakes me up around 4 <laughs> o'clock in the morning with the most ridiculous things. Uh, but, but, I like her color, but she's yeah, so blue. It's like she's such a downer. Oh, oh my such God. A downer, such a downer. So funny. Uh, but, you know, put, put the situation in context, first of all. You know, we, when we're, we're looking at everything through this, this thing that's happening, it's, like, it's so easy to just let that train run off the tracks. You know, you're, you know, like I mentioned with Laura, you know, I'm never going to have another job and, you know, I'm going to die and, you know, I'm, my husband's going to leave me and all that stuff. It just, you know, goes crazy. So if you put it in context, is this thing really this big, you know, in the grand scheme of things, is this going to be this awful this time next year? Um, or is there some positive to this in this big, you know, negative mess? Is there something positive that could possibly come from this? So, you know, mm -hmm. putting it in context, not allowing it to be 
this light on the train coming right at you, you know, and, and one way to manage the voice in the head and put things in context is not to isolate yourself, you know, get with people that are trusted advisors, um, you know, good confidants, you know, people that will tell you the truth that will challenge your thinking that will remind you of what's really true and real, you know, just don't, don't isolate yourself. I tend to isolate. I, separate from everything and I am in my I'm going to figure this out I'm going to solve this problem you know when if I had just surrounded myself with two or three really good friends that uh, that always have my back I could have come out of it a lot sooner love that and you know here's another question respond versus react can you give another example of the difference with this yeah so with responding um instead of reacting response is a choice that we're making stephen covey says um he calls it response ability that i mean i love the way he breaks that down is that you know responsibility we we know what responsibility looks like but he says it's response ability you have the ability to choose the response. Whereas react is knee jerk, man. It's just, you know, it's a chain reaction. I'm responding to this thing that's happened. I've gone into whatever my mode is when things happen. You know, some people, uh, they get very depressed. They go to sleep. They uh, overeat or, or overindulge with alcohol. They do all kinds of, of chain reaction things which just lead to no good outcome. But if we take the time, take a step back, take that pause and choose what is the what is going to be the best solution here. Responding is a conscious choice. And I have multiple options. You know, when you begin to to take a look at it, you're like, well, I actually have I have more than one option here. And I get to choose what I think is the best course of action. So respond is, is pausing, taking the time to think about it, reacting is no thinking, just, just a knee jerk response. That's great, that's great. Here's another question. Um, how do you handle employees who from uh, this person's perspective are not being very resilient during a company shift? And the mention was technology changes. Mm -hmm. So when I work and I, you know, my background was in technology and, and for more than 25 years, I led large technology teams and change was the order of the day. We were either implementing a system or we were ripping out a system or we were modifying a system, you know, or, uh, and technology, new technology is always a challenge, especially with tech people who think they are change junkies. And what does it boil down to? Change is all about me, right? Change is very personal, even when it's in a corporate setting. Change is personal and the way our employees respond to it is unique to what their experience is, is with it. What is it that they're afraid of? Uh, are they afraid they're gonna lose their job? Are they afraid they won't be able to keep up with new technology? Are they afraid that their world is just going to shift in ways that they don't, don't like? It's a fear of the unknown uh, of, and a fear of how does this impact me? Because you know, if you are leading people in a, in, in a company or leading teams, really, really internalize this idea that change is personal. It's not just business. So if you've got people in your teams that are not responding well to change, or you're starting to see uh, negative emotions or fear or things like that coming out, you need to get very close to those individuals, you know, spend some time with them. And, and I realize I'm probably talking to people who are already have more than enough on their plate to not be able to spend <laughs> a lot of time with people. But in the long run, it will serve you very well. Find out what it is that they're so afraid of. And is there anything you can do about that? And if there isn't anything you can do, it, don't make promises you can't keep, but at least asking what's going on with them, giving them that chance to use you as a sounding board, sometimes just takes a lot of the sting away from it. 
That's really, no, that's a great perspective. Cause again, you know, I mean, I run a small business, right? So small. And it's like, we have team members I don't see, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. the, the virtual thing where you don't have the, the great element of being able to read people with nonverbals, I think yeah. is a big one, right? Because mm-hmm. I, you know, I had just that kind of example. I just didn't know quite how to handle, but I felt like I had an employee being resistant to some things going on. And, and I've been resistant, you know, to mm-hmm. change on certain levels. So, you know, this is really great perspective. Um, you know, I think the only, the last question, I think you addressed this, but I didn't know if you had any other thoughts is, you know, what else can I do to quash the voices in my head? I, you know, I, I, my suggestion is go watch the Disney movie, but I know that's not the <laughs> professional answer because when you do, you'll laugh and you go, oh my God, you know, you can just, I visualize shifting the little voices from one to the other and it's hard, right? You got to kind of run and you got to recognize that you're doing it and yeah. not being resilient. So what else would you suggest? And that'll be our final question. All right. Well, uh, again, the voice in the head uh, is is uh, ever present, uh, never goes away. So that's why you get to practice your resilience factor every day, <laughs> over and every over. hour, <laughs> every minute. Yeah. Uh, so really um, recognizing it is a big deal. And, you know, and I think if you watch the movie and you, and you put that into that context, it's like, you go, Oh God, there's my blue lady again, you know, stop it, stop it. But, uh, like I said, challenge it with a more, uh, rational thought. Um, you know, one, one that I share in, in the book is, um, is a belief that I had about myself for a long time that you never finish anything. You have all these great ideas, but you never finish anything. Oh, you never finish anything. Mm-hmm. I have no idea where that even came from because I've finished lots of things, you know, in my life. I've finished tons of things in my life. So when that began to uh, to become a part of my mantra, you know, the mantra inside my head, oh, don't even try that because you'll never finish it. You know, sounds like a good idea, but you'll never finish it. Then I, I started to say, ooh, yes, I do. Yes, I I finished lots of things. You know, I, I've given tons of speeches. I've written a book. I've uh, mm-hmm. developed new curriculum. I teach classes, you know, three times a week and those all end. I'm not still there. So I do finish things. And sometimes the, you know, I say challenge it with a rational thought, but sometimes it's even challenge it with a stupid thought, you know, like, are you kidding me? Like, you know, what I, I think I said earlier about, right. man, you should have never worn that. You know, well, guess what? Nobody's even looking at you. So get over it, you know. So I love that phrase control your mind, control your thoughts, control your future, right? A little bit. But then, you know, it's how we handle circumstances. Patty, this was awesome. I want to say thank you for being our amazing thought leader today, right? We are here every other Monday with another Women Lead webinar. And for our attendees, we hope you enjoyed, you know, having us share some different thoughts on being a more effective leader in business. And we will be back again soon. Um, And it's Monday. So have a fabulous week. And Patty, thank you again.